to come and have a look at God's Word. Um, and we're continuing, it's our final part in our Hebrews 11 series, Walk by Faith, as we, we look at some of the figures in that chapter uh, and their example of faith to us. And today we've just got two verses from Hebrews 11, so we'll, we'll read these first. Uh, and this is verses 30 and 31. It says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched round them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. I also want us to read from Matthew's Gospel and the genealogy which uh, introduces Christ. And I've asked Helen if she would read this wonderful passage. If we're in church, we'd be cheering at certain points. But Helen's going to pronounce every single name fluently, without mistake, and, uh, and 16 verses of name after name. So please cheer at home for Helen as she does this. I'm going to just pick up from there. Let's just finish off the reading. We've got problems with Helen's microphone, which we'll try and sort out. But let's go on. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Amon. Amon, the father of Josiah. Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel the father of Abihud, Abihud the father of Eliakim, Eliakim the father of Azor, Azor the father of Zadok, Zadok the father of Achim, Achim the father of Elihud, Elihud the father of Eliezer, Eliezer the father of of Matan, Matan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. You didn't hear how well Helen presented those, I don't think, or you didn't hear them very clearly, but Helen did a sterling job, um, but you didn't get to hear that. But uh, Helen will do her own rendition for you if you wanted to, and, uh, and we'll get that up and put it on uh, so you can listen to that. Let's pray together as we look at God's Word. Father, we thank you for your Word, and all Scripture is God-breathed, and as we think about your Word, Lord, may we hear your voice through it today. Draw us to yourself, bring us your thoughts, that we might worship you more fully. In the name of Jesus, amen. Sometimes heroes and heroines come from unexpected places. Rosa Parks was 42 when she refused to give up her seat to a white passenger on a segregated bus in Montgomery in 1955. She was duly arrested, but her bravery led to the Montgomery bus boycott, which in turn made a huge contribution to the ending of racial segregation in the United States. Or there's Dida Hussein, who was a humble garment factory worker in Dhaka, Bangladesh. That was until the building collapsed and hundreds of lives were lost. He described what he did next. As a human being, I felt it was my duty to try and help other human beings. When I first went in, I saw a dead body and I was frightened, but I gathered up my courage and went on. He then rescued 34 people from the crumbled factory. He encountered victims who had limbs trapped under heavy concrete, and when a local doctor was too afraid to do so, he took a knife and amputated an arm and a leg to free two people. Or more controversially, Stephen Gallant, he's on the left here of the picture on the left, a convicted murderer, who was one of those who fought back against knife-wielding terrorist Usman Khan in the 2019 London Bridge attack. Khan appeared to be wearing a suicide vest. The Ministry of Justice recognized Gallant's exceptionally brave actions and said he helped save people's lives despite the tremendous risk to his own. Heroes and heroines can come from unexpected places. As we've walked down the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11, we have come across names we probably expected to encounter. Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Moses, these are celebrated figures of Israel's past. But now in verses 30 and 31, we have an unexpected heroine, Rahab, a woman, 
only one of two in the list. A foreigner belonging to one of the degenerate people group living in Canaan and a prostitute. She makes it into the hall of faith, whereas others, such as Joshua, don't get mentioned by name. Rahab's story is told in Joshua's chapter 2 and 6, and you can read the story in, in more detail there. God's people, the Israelites, are finally ready to enter the promised land, and so they send out two spies to check the terrain, particularly to check out the city of Jericho. The spies entered Jericho, and they end up at Rahab's house. She's a prostitute, as it says repeatedly in both the Old and the New Testaments. It's interesting that other Old Testament figures aren't known by their failings. We, we don't uh, label Moses as a murderer Moses, or Abraham as a liar Abraham, or uh, Noah as drunkard Noah, and yet we talk about prostitute Rahab as if it's her first name. She lives on the city wall, which is probably quite convenient for passing trade. And whilst we can't be 100% certain as to why these two spies end up at her house, I think probably the best guess is that it was the easiest place for foreigners to be inconspicuous. And then Rahab takes a huge risk. Whilst when the king of Jericho hears that two Israelites have come to her house, and rather than give them up to the king, what she decides to do is she hides them, which presumably was at risk to her life and maybe the life, life of all those in her household. And the reason she hides them, we're told, is because she believes the God of these spies, the God of the Israelites, is the true God, the all-powerful, the almighty. And as she explains to the spies, she says, the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. She sees this God, the God of the Israelites, as her only hope, and she puts her trust and faith in him. She deals, or does a deal with the spies. She says that she will hide them if they spare her and her family when Jericho falls. And they come up with this uh, marker so that the, the soldiers know that she would tie a scarlet cord outside her window. And the book of Joshua tells us then that the Israelites march round the, the walls of Jericho for seven days and the walls collapse by themselves. The Israelites then enter into the city. They kill everyone and everything in the city, but they spare Rahab and her family as agreed. And she enjoins herself to the Israelite community. So it's remarkable that she appears in this list in Hebrews 11, in this hall of faith. But even more remarkably, sorry, but it's even more remarkable that is Matthew's claim in the genealogy that we, we looked at earlier that Rahab is part of the ancestral line of King David. In fact, not only is she part of the ancestral line of King David, she's part of the ancestral line of Jesus. I, I wanted Helen to have a go at that reading because I thought it would be quite interesting to see how well she pronounced the words. And she did sparkling well, I, I tell you that. But, but in, um, the reason Matthew includes uh, Rahab is that Matthew wants to say that she is part of God's plans and purposes through history which culminate in the arrival of Jesus. Let me just bring us to the key verse. This is verse 5 and uh, verse 6 as well. Salmon, the farmer, father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jess, and Jess, the father of King David. Uh, just to say there, it might, if you just work that out, it, you might think, well, she's therefore great-great-grandfather of, of David. Actually, what uh, Matthew does is he misses out generations. So uh, she may well have been further back than that. Uh, his, his purpose is to get three lots of 14 generations in his genealogy. But she appears in this list. She's just one of four women that appear. There's 42 men in the list. The other women are Tamar. Uh, Tamar is, uh, she wasn't a prostitute, but she pretended to be a prostitute to ensure her father-in-law Judah treated her properly. You can read her story in Genesis 38. We also have in the list Ruth. 
Uh, Ruth was a Moabite, a foreigner, who marries uh, an Israelite. Uh, Her husband dies. And then she cleaves to her mother-in-law, Naomi, and to her mother-in-law's God, the God of Israel. And the fourth woman, who's not mentioned by name, but is mentioned as Uriah's wife, is Bathsheba. And it's Bathsheba. um, It is the adulterous relationship that King David has with her, because she's married at the time, uh, that produces the greatest king Israel ever had, Solomon. So we have these four women. And days, uh, Matthew writes this list because it really is through the men that, that really the, the important things happen. It's the men that are important in the genealogy list. And yet he includes these four women. And he does so because he wants to demonstrate that God's purposes and God's plans are both surprising and, I think, involve scandal. Matthew gets down in his list, his purpose is... To, to get to verse 16, as he writes this, and he, he writes in verse 16, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. And so Mary, this teenager, probably a young teenager, not yet married, only pledged to be married, falls pregnant, which is both shocking and scandalous. And yet what Matthew wants to say is that God works through the surprising things, through the things that appear shocking and scandalous. Mary hadn't done anything wrong. She was pure and innocent. But others around thought she had with a nod and a wig. Know what I mean? They thought she had. And Matthew wants to make the point that God's plans and purposes are both surprising and they can work through apparent scandal. So we have Rahab in, in the list in Hebrews 11 and in Matthew's genealogy. It is both, in both lists, it is an extraordinary inclusion. Let me suggest three of the things that her inclusion in these lists teaches us. The first one is this. In God's economy, outsiders can become insiders. We we have this over and over again in the Gospels. We see Jesus drawing those who are marginalized, those who are on the edges, those who are on the fringes, being drawn in. I love the Tony Campolo story. I, I've shared it a couple of times. I think Stephen's used it as well when he's spoken. But where he goes and stays in a hotel in Hawaii, and because of the time difference, in the middle of the night he wakes up, he can't sleep. And so he, he goes out on for a walk, and he ends up in a bar, 3 o'clock in the morning, and he, he sits down and has a drink. And then a group of prostitutes walk in, having finished their night's work. And he, uh, he overhears this group of prostitutes talking, and it's one of their birthday days ne- the next day. And so he whispers to the bartender, he said, what about we throw her a party tomorrow? The bartender thinks it's great. And so when the, the group of prostitutes arrive, three o'clock on the next day, uh, there they are with banners and streamers and balloons, and they've got a cake. And, and the woman is overwhelmed. This has never happened to her. No one has ever marked her birthday before. And Campolo then says, would you like me just to say a prayer for you? And the bartender, hearing this, is quite shocked and gets quite angry. He says, you never told me you were a preacher. What sort of church do you belong to? Which Campolo gives the the wonderful reply. He says, a church that throws parties for prostitutes at three in the morning. This is what the church is about. The church is a place that throws parties for prostitutes at three in the morning that actually draws those who are outside, inside. In God's economy, outsiders are welcome. And this is what happens with Rahab. But not only are they welcome, but they are incorporated into God's plans and purposes. It's not only that outsiders are recipients of God's blessings, but they become a source of blessing to others. Rahab helps the Israelites to enter the promised land. Rahab is part of the lineage of the Savior. God works out his plans through the most extraordinary people. Some of you might have been watching on on the BBC's news uh, the past couple of weeks about some work going on in Burnley by the churches. Um, And uh, there's a pastor there called Mick Fleming um, who 
along with Father Alex Frost, they've been helping to feed and clothe the poor. They set up a church called the Church on the Street. They've got no building. They, they run it out of the back of cars and vans. The BBC carried a story on Friday about Pastor Mick's background. Uh, up to 11 years ago, he was a drug dealer and debt collector. He'd been arrested for murder twice, armed robbery three times, and countless firearms offences. And then he met Pastor Tony, and Pastor Tony gently drew him towards God. Uh, he went on to theological college and then to begin street ministry, and he ministers now with addicts, with the homeless, and with the hungry. You see, God's purpose, as shown there through Pastor Mick, is not only to bless those who are outside, but to incorporate them to be a blessing to others. Which brings us to a, a final point. As this happens, this reveals to us who is at work. When a person with, uh, with natural abilities, may, maybe certain privileges and natural skills, when they accomplish something, we, we perhaps talk about what they've done. We give them the glory. We talk about how good they are or how, how clever they are. But when someone who we might be tempted to write off does something noteworthy or significant, it causes us to ask questions as to why were they able to do that? What caused it? And hopefully it causes us to see God's hand in their work. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians about this. He says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you're in Christ Jesus who became for us the wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Why does the Hall of Fame not mention Joshua in verse 30, but mention Rahab in verse 31? It's an interesting question. I, I just suggest to you that maybe it doesn't mention in Josh, Joshua in verse 30 because actually it gives glory to God because the walls fell not through Joshua's great leadership, not through his mighty strategy, but they fell through the power of God. So not mentioning Joshua in verse 30 brings more glory to God, but actually mentioning Rahab because of who she was and her background, because she was an outsider, mentioning Rahab specifically by name also brings glory to God. Mention, not mentioning Joshua brings glory to God, mentioning Rahab brings glory to God. God, God glorifies himself through bringing the outsider in, through incorporating them into his plan and purposes, through bringing salvation through those who we least expect. And this brings us full circle back to Mary, this young girl of lowly status, whom God chose to be the one through whom God's salvation plan will literally be delivered. And Mary, well, her faith, like Rahab's faith, though they're very different characters, Mary shows us what true faith is like. Her response to God when the angel calls her is this, may it be to me according to your word. And I was thinking today, and some of us will have found the news yesterday very difficult. You, you'll have found the restrictions that are placed on you very hard. And yet what Mary shows us is that there, uh, there is, is something about passivity where we actually surrender ourselves to God. We say to God, God, you're in control. And actually, may it be to you as it, it's, it's happening to me. May it be to you as you want here. And we submit ourselves and, and we bring glory to God through that. And we trust God. 
We find Mary makes this passive response. Sometimes it's right as Christians, we are active in our response. We challenge things, we work at things, but at other times, things are done to us. As they were done to our Lord Jesus, but as Mary accepted, we're being done to her. And our faith is one where we say, may it be done to me according to your word. So we have these two women of faith, quite different characters. They show us how to respond to the God who calls outsiders, to the God who calls nobodies, to be somebodies in his kingdom, to play a part in the salvation plan he has for the world. Let's pray together. I just want to use Mary's prayer. May it be to me according to your word. And we might feel that we are buffeted at the moment, that we are simply things are happening to us and we can't control them, we don't like them. But we now submit ourselves to the Lord. We trust that he is in charge. We trust that he has all things in his hands. And Lord, we pray to you, may it be to me according to your word, according to your plan. We are your humble servants. May it be to us according to your word.